uh, that's what I want to cover. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very uh, uh, high level talk for the introductory part. Um, so I would not prove anything, but just recall things just to locate. It was one question to see how these things are connected. I mean, this topological question and uh, topological groups are measured, things like that, and the unimodular uh, random graphs. I will then introduce the random graphs themselves. And uh, the idea was to go through applications, uh, fundamentally, so uh, I've selected three. And so I said in the abstract that I would cover also some connection with span calculus, but uh, I think that would be too ambitious. Okay, uh, hey, what happens? Okay, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so let me recall uh, just, I mean, uh, the, the, I want to connect deterministic unimodularity with random one. And that's why there will be some uh, uh, introduction here on the topological groups and uh, our measure. So uh, you have a, what is a topological group? So, uh, <clears throat> so it's a group, uh, which is at the same time a topological space with uh, good properties. Uh, uh, so um, uh, locally compact and Hausdorff in this setting. So you don't need the second countable. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, two, two points here, neighborhoods uh, which uh, are disjoint. Uh, open neighborhoods which are of the two points which are disjoint. Uh, and uh, the only connection between the two uh, compatibility issues is that uh, so the map uh, to which the two points of the group associate the uh, uh, <coughs> composition uh, according to the group is uh, continuous and also the inverse is continuous. Okay, so we good. And so, uh, for all such uh, topological groups, there is a R measure on the right and one on the left. So here I described the one on the left. First, uh, measure mu is called uh, left translation invariant. So these are generalization of Lebesgue measure for uh, <coughs> RD. And uh, measure is called left translation invariant if uh, for all sets, Borel sets, so it's a topological group, so there is a Borel sigma algebra, uh, B of X, uh, you have that uh, uh, mu of XS, the translate uh, of S on the left by X is mu of X, right? So this is tra left translation invariant measure. And Haar theorem uh, says that up to a multiple up to a multiplicative constant, there exists a unique, sufficiently regular, there is notion of uh, outer regular, inner regular, uh, but uh, so up to this regularity uh, question, there is a unique non-trivial measure lambda, which is left translation variant and uh, locally finite, which means Uh, on compact this one on the right as well to the big measure so we are used to the big measure which is the one which is left invariant by translations <coughs> on the Euclidean space but uh, on general topological spaces uh, it's not guaranteed that the uh, R measure on the left and the R measure on the right are the same and there exists a beautiful object which is called the modular function delta from the topological group to R plus which is says that if uh, you take this left uh, invariant R measure lambda and now translate on the right, so lambda of Sx, uh, then this will be equal to lambda of S uh, up to a multiplicative uh, constant, delta of x. And uh, this uh, function is, uh, is well defined and has uh, various uh, uh, homeomorphism. Um, uh, so, okay, so it, but we will be interested mostly in the, so, in the unimodular case, uh, a topological group is said to be unimodular if its modular function is equal to one, or equivalently if the left and R, right uh, R measures are uh, the same, like Lebesgue measure on the, the RD, seen as a group, topological group. Okay, uh, and the general theorem is that if a uh, uh, topological group is transitive, and countable, then it is unimodular. So 
the mid or major. So this is a sufficient condition and good uh, classification. Also transitive in that uh, context means. Ah, so uh, a group action is transitive if you take two two points of the space on which the action uh, acts and the group action acts. Uh, there is an element of the group that brings the first to the second. It's some sort of uh, irreducibility uh, condition. If you want. So this is. Uh, yeah, think of it as irreducibility. Okay, and here uh, you let the, uh, for in this definition, since there is no, there is only one space, you let the group act on itself. Okay, now unimodular graphs uh, are uh, animals uh, of the same uh, uh, nature. Uh, so, uh, you take, uh, you, you consider it is for sparse graphs. You have may, maybe heard about graphons or things like that, which are dense graphs. But for sparse graphs, uh, namely locally finite graphs, so the graph uh, G uh, with vertices V and uh, edges E is locally finite. Uh, if uh, balls for graph distance have a finitely contained many, uh, finitely many. So it excludes like infinite degrees or things like that. So it's quite sparse. Uh, so a graph automorphism is a bijection on the set of vertices, such that if there is an edge from X to Y, uh, there is one from gamma of X to gamma of Y uh, for, all, uh, for all X and Y. So the set of uh, all automorphisms is a topological group. There is a nice uh, notion of uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, pointwise convergence for, uh, for automorphisms. And uh, one says that the graph is unimodular if its uh, automorphism group uh, is unimodular. Yeah. And so I think uh, to be concrete of, uh, I don't know, the, uh, a graph being a ZD uh, equipped uh, so you see that all, trans all uh, translations uh, preserve are automorphisms of uh, uh, integer value uh, uh, translations uh, are automorphisms of this graph. Uh, and so, uh, so you can look at more generally at the whole uh, set of automorphisms. And if this, if this group is unimodular, then uh, uh, you say that the graph is. OK, and we will see uh, later uh, examples. Huh? Uh, so again, uh, the notion of transitivity. Now, the graph is vertex transitive uh, if uh, when you look at the automorphism. So automorphism is uh, um, uh, uh, of the graph. So it's acting on the vertices. Uh, so if for every pair of points x and y in v2, uh, there exists a gamma an automorphism that brings uh, uh, x to y for tra translations, integer value translations on the, on the grid is clear. Excuse me, just back to the previous theorem. So, can you go back to the previous slide? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, transitive and countable. We will see uh, examples later with the okay. Cayley graphs okay. um, in, uh, to, to, to give them to the. Uh, and ju ju just uh, so in that, in that specific case, for example, the, the, the set of uh, automorphisms, can, can it be non transitive? Uh, the, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you can get lots of examples of, uh, okay. so here the, the thing was on topological groups okay. and the transitive here. Now uh, we discuss uh, graphs, right? Yeah, sure. And uh, yes, you can construct, I mean, topological groups, which are not transitive. Yeah, but I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, can you construct graphs such that the group of automorphisms is not transitive. Yeah, I think there are examples. Okay. Okay, and now uh, I come to the main uh, thing to connect uh, things later, right? Which is uh, the mass transport principle. So um, you take a vertex transitive uh, uh, 
So, yeah, first, I said I defined what the uh, unimodular graph was. It's just an, a graph uh, such that the automorphism group is uh, seen as a topological group is, uh, is unimodular, right? And so the theorem, which is the mass transport principle, is a, as soon as you have a unimodular graph, which is also vertex transitive, I said, I defined what it was. Uh, then, uh, if you take any function which is uh, uh, diagonally invariant with respect to the action of the automorphism, so I will explain what it does in a second. So, but formally, uh, this is the thing which is given here um, uh, uh, in the definition. Uh, uh, you take any gamma which is an automorphism, it should be such that f of gamma x zero and y should be f of x one. And so, uh, so uh, typically, um, this would be, uh, for instance, uh, this would be about transporting mass, right? The F, which we show uh, in the mass transport equation, you can see as transporting mass from X to Y, right? And if you have a graph, uh, if you have an, uh, uh, an automorphism on the graph, uh, it means that, I mean, what uh, happens between X and Y is the same as what happens between gamma of X and gamma of Y. And then you should, if you send mass one or two uh, between x and y, you should also send the same mass uh, from gamma of x to gamma of y. So uh, this is what would happen in, in Euclidean graphs, where you, uh, if you take, two, you would have graphs which are, which are, uh, which, uh, for instance, on the, take uh, ZD, right? Uh, if you if you send mass from one to two, you should send the same mass from two to three, right? That's what it says because. There is an uh, automorphism from that sense uh, <clears throat> at the point that shift the point. And, and so, what is the theorem? The mass transport principle is the basis of uh, what will be extended later, but so just to keep the connection, is that for all vertex transitive unimodular graphs, uh, for all uh, function Vf, which has this uh, invariance property, you have the mass transport equation that holds. And if you send, look at the total mass that you, you pick a, a vertex, any vertex, you look at the total mass that flows from this vertex to all other points of the graph, then it should match the sum of the masses received by this point, sent by all vertices to this point. Okay, so that's the connection. Now we go to unimodular graphs, random graphs. So the first thing uh, which uh, requires lots of uh, thinking and uh, we will just give the results and not the measurability issues. <laughs> the devil is in the detail. Right? So uh, now you lo look at the locally finite graph. I defined what it was. So balls contain finitely many points. So it's locally, locally finite. Uh, and one defines a rooted graph and more uh, precisely uh, so, uh, equivalence class of rooted graphs by graph isomorphism. So, you pick an infinite graph or finite graph, okay, and you add a root. When you have a root, uh, you can look at what happens around the root. There is a neighborhood in terms of graph distance. And actually, you can make the space of rooted locally finite graphs a complete separable metric space. Which is, uh, so if you look at infinite graphs, it's very difficult to make it a topological space. But if you look at rooted graphs, uh, there is a fantastic way, a beautiful way of building uh, a metric. Uh, so you can make the set of uh, rooted space a metric space. Uh, rooted, uh, uh, of rooted graphs, uh, 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 topological space, and even a good, good topological space. Uh, <clears throat> Will be separable with a countable set of uh, uh, <laughs> that generates the whole space and will be okay. So that's the set. And because of that, what you have to do is you can do that only on equivalence classes, not on graphs themselves, but on equivalence classes of graphs. Namely, uh, the metric that you put bears on the equivalence classes. And so these uh, brackets represent uh, equivalence classes by graph isomorphism. So two graphs which are isomorphic. You get, get G, uh, G uh, O and G prime O prime uh, will be the same object uh, uh, on this uh, Okay, 
And so uh, this space is a good space. You can. Uh, what do you mean? Yeah. Is, is it just because you want the severability property? Or? No, just it's because it, it's even to, uh, you have to think that you, you define, you want to handle infinite objects, okay. infinite graphs. And you have to you have to put if you want to define a random graph, mm -hmm. you have to put uh, a sigma algebra on mm -hmm. the space of infinite graphs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the canonical way uh, is uh, this one. Then you look at equilus classes. You define on this equilus classes a metric, and then you look at the sigma Borel sigma algebra uh, with respect to this topology. And then you can make sense of what an infinite random graph is. Okay. Does it answer your question? Yes. Yes. As far as possible, I think. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, going through all this uh, would take uh, 40, uh, 50 hours. Yeah. To, yeah. to, to, to uh, the, what I mean yeah, sure. today. So uh, I just uh, I said I did not prove everything. Right? <laughs> okay. And so a random rooted graph. Then possible to define that, right? So, and you have to think of, of the graph itself as being random, but seen from a root which is itself a random object. Right? So that's the mental picture to make sense, as a in major theoretic sense, of what a random infinite. Of course, if it's finite, you don't have to all this, problem, but to want to handle infinite. And one says uh, it's a uh, definition is uh, due to the uh, axiom. Uh, Unimodularity is very old thing, but now uh, one would say that a random graph is unimodular if it satisfies the mass transport equation. Now G uh, acts on equivalence classes, also this notion of joint uh, invariance by uh, whatever automorphisms or isomorphisms is not indeed. You take a function G, there are majority issues for this to make sense, but what you want is that basically, so you send mass from any point to any other point, according to something that takes the whole graph into account and makes it a function of the whole graph. Okay, and if you do that uh, by preserving uh, uh, that uh, uh, isomorphism, things like that, then uh, the total mass that flows from O to, uh, you look at total mass that flows to all the, all of the edges of the graph, is a total mass that flows from the, uh, these guys, the uh, other edges of the graph, to the origin. This is the mass transport principle for probability. Yeah. Uh, well, I have a question. Uh, on this metric, what do you call random compared to the good uh, random? Uh, what is the difference between it's the pure value, where the random is? How do you random is exactly? Uh, well, the basic question. <laughs> yes, right. So, I mean, uh, the, as usual, I mean, uh, the deterministic is a special case of random. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so. And uh, there are lots of uh, models that we'll see in the course of examples where you need uh, to manipulate random graphs, right? Uh, and uh, so the, the, you, you, you have seen the, uh, so perhaps I will give, answer your question more in detail after the example. Yeah, okay. mm. And I have another question. Yes. Uh, said, uh, so the function, uh, uh, say for all G. Uh, yes. Uh, Ha, yes. And uh, there is a sum, but the sum because you have infinite graph, the sum may be infinite. Sure, so. yeah. Then uh, infinity is equal to infinity. Is, uh, is, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's an equality, right? Okay, and uh, perhaps I will answer your question. So then you want to devise, and that's why I did the preliminary part with the deterministic case, where you uh, manipulate. Uh, this notion of uh, unimodality such that the definition which people in group theory have been handling for uh, decades uh, uh, is a special case of what probabilists currently do in terms of manipulating the random version of the uh, mass transport principle, right? And so, uh, indeed, so this certain discrete subsets of R uh, K and uh, so any K graph take any group which is finitely generated, uh, the Cayley graph of this uh, finitely generated group is unimodular. Mm -hmm. So it goes already there way beyond the Euclidean setting uh, to uh, so discrete uh, uh, 
so these are instances of telegraphs, of course, but so the discrete subsets of RD, uh, which are deterministic grids uh, um, in uh, any dimensions, I mean, no types of grids uh, are um, unimodular. And uh, as a consequence of these things that we said, this theorem, uh, which for which you ask question, uh, um, uh, 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 every telegraph of a finitely generated group is uh, uh, is transitive, and so uh, and the, the object that you build uh, uh, as the, actually is unimodular. It's a, it's a general result. Okay, but there are lots of objects that you manipulate uh, in everyday life uh, uh, that are uh, not deterministic, which are random. And so uh, you have a, a point process, stationary point process on the left. You have an into infinite tree, uh, which is called the uh, unimodal uh, Galton Watson tree that I will not describe here. And you have a random graphs that show, for instance, I will discuss uh, and, and give examples on uh, objects which are, for instance, the graph of a random walk. And these are objects, and you want to see these objects. Can you apply the mass transport principle to these objects? And so, uh, for that, for if you want a unifying framework for all these uh, objects, you need the framework that uh, has the random, uh, infinite random uh, uh, sparse graphs, right? Uh, locally fine. So that's, I hope you can answer. So you, that's the answer to your question, at least at the level of it. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Uh, yes. Do, do you mean the automorphism is the clusters are equivalent to the velocity equivalent? So automorphisms, of course, uh, there would be uh, uh, automorphisms more in this class, right? Uh, the uh, uh, classes of uh, which are important in the random case, for instance, if it's a stationary point process, you have interesting connection between uh, uh, translates of this uh, stationary point process. So the two, two translates of, I take this thing, I shift it of something, and they are of course uh, uh, isomorphic, right? Uh, so here, in this case, you might have no automorphism, but you have interesting, uh, when you look at the class, the class of uh, uh, graphs which are uh, uh, isomorphic, then uh, for instance, the graphs which would be associated with these point processes would be isomorphic to the translates. Hmm. But if you want a general theory, you have to handle uh, uh, both the deterministic and the stochastic case. Okay, so now uh, to uh, clarify things and connect things now, uh, some theorems and proving each of them would require uh, <laughs> some, quite some time. So the Palm version of any stationary point process uh, you can see this as uh, uh, actually a random discrete subset of RK, uh, which is invariant by translation. And uh, the Palm version is the conditioning of, uh, and so you, you could, for instance, uh, add any graph if you want to, to, uh, to uh, on, on that, any covariant graph, I don't know, neighbor, I mean, the five closest neighbor graph, something like that. And so uh, conditioned on the uh, fact that the origin is a point, so this is a so-called palm version of a stationary point process. Uh, and so uh, all graphs defined on stationary point processes under their palm version are unimodular. And then we will use that in the example. Uh, so take now uh, other uh, graphs <coughs> which are associated to uh, stochastic processes. So you take a stationary stochastic process Y, uh, and uh, you look at the uh, you you take the the random walk uh, based on this increment. So you take uh, Y um, the X, which is the sum of the Ys, and you do this on the left and on the right. Huh? And so then uh, you your vertices are the. Uh, 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 are the places uh, seen uh, visited by the random walk, and you say to take an edge between two adjacent uh, uh, vertices. And so this map, so I'm here, I'm interesting measuring issues. 
from the y's to the let's say of graphs, so the graphs is the root that at zero, for instance, it's a measure of a graph on this uh, space of uh, graphs. And hence, this guy is a random variable, is a random graph because of the measurability uh, 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 property. You have a property space that contains the y. Out of that, you send it. You send this probability to the space of uh, routing graphs. Okay. And so, uh, what is the result? Uh, if uh, the random walk uh, in question is transient, and if it is simple, and we know no superposition of points, uh, then um, uh, uh, the uh, this is uh, this is a unimodular graph. Okay. And uh, here is an illustration of that, actually, of a slightly different property. This was just, I mean, the, 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 uh, the value taken by the random walk. Now you look at something which is different, which is the trajectory. So it lives in RD, okay? Uh, on the x axis, uh, you have the uh, iterate, right? So the, you have iterate zero, iterate one, so forth. And you think of our D in the cross that, right? And you look at where the random walk lies. This is the graph of the random walk. And so now, without any condition, just under the Y being uh, stationary, this graph is a very thin object in RD. It's not a stationary point process. Okay, assuming transient graph, a transient walk, for instance, right? So it is a sort of dust in a given direction. And uh, uh, so it's not a stationary point process. It's a very thin, thinner object than a stationary point process. But this guy is always unimodular. You can apply mass transport to it. You root it at zero. Okay. And uh, here is a uh, along these lines, uh, a very interesting uh, setting, which also goes beyond stationarity. Uh, the point process is set post stationarity. A post stationary, sorry, if its probability distribution is uh, supported by uh, counting measures so no, without accumulation, and if it satisfies uh, the mass transport equation. So uh, that's uh, one, one possible way. Uh, or the equivalent way is that it is invariant by what are called bijective point shifts. So, for instance, uh, take uh, the zeros of a random walk. Take a, a symmetric random walk and take its zeros. So it's not a stationary point process, but if you move from zero to zero, you see the same point process. So it's invariant by uh, bijection. Uh, right. And uh, so this guy is not a stationary point process, but it is point stationary, and therefore it satisfies the mass transport. It is uh, it's, uh, minimum. Okay, good. Uh, these are examples. And well, uh, last is the, perhaps uh, the one I should have started with. Take any random graph, uh, your favorite graph, Erdos Reni, whatever, right? And um, pick a finite, right? But there is a collection of those indexed by n, n is the cardinality of the graph. And you let n blow to infinity, and you assume that you have chosen the root before blowing n to infinity randomly, uniformly at random on the finite graph, which is possible, it's finite. Take root, pick at random, right? Then you let go, you blow the thing. And if the limit exists and is sparse, this is a notion of a lo local weak limit. If local weak limit exists, then the limiting infinite object is unimodular. And so uh, here actually you, you see you see really the sense of it, right? For, for this instance. Because what is unimodularity? When you pick the root at random, it's just a double sum, right? And the double uh, by Fubini, double sums are very uh, uh, you, you, you can you can change the order of uh, of uh, zero v or v zero are exactly the same, right? And so for finite graphs, it's easy. And the question is whether the limit exists. But if the limit exists and this is local weak convergence, then you are done. So every object that you manipulate which is finite and which has a local weak limit is uh, unimodular. So it's uh, it's quite general. Okay, now. <coughs> Let me introduce uh, the notion of marks uh, before going to the examples. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, you, you must have seen marks for point processes. Huh? 
uh, for a point process, for instance, a, a very fantastic object is the universal mark, a stationary point process. What is universal mark? It is the point process seen from that point. Okay. And what happens is that if you shift the point process, this mark follows, right? The, the every point, right? The universal mark. Right? So this is the essence of what marking is. So functionals of the points, which are invariant by translations, namely by graph isomorphisms. Okay, now make it general. You say uh, a marking uh, is a function from V cross V to a same measure space. Okay, whatever. Uh, good, uh, good measure space, uh, xi, uh, such that what I said uh, uh, holds, namely, uh, so to every, uh, so you, uh, you take, uh, so here you put marks on edges. So the edges could be, uh, for example, V could be, uh, the two points could be the same and diagonal and it would represent the point. Right? Uh, uh, right? So, uh, and so to, now to each edge or each vertex, you associate uh, something that takes value inside, right? And what you want, yes. And can we represent this uh, marking function as a matrix? As a matrix. Yeah, you can do that because I mean you have v cross v, and you enter uh, okay, and you you populate this matrix by uh, and the diagonal would be the the marks of the vertices, and you mark edges and vertices. But you want to you want this to be a, a functional of the graph of the geometry of the graph, right? And so it ought to be such, like uh, what I said for the translation, that uh, uh, um, so that this mark, this function should be compatible with graph isomorphisms. Namely, if I take a graph uh, isomorphism O, whatever it is, uh, and if I look if I import uh, from, uh, uh, if I import something from G1 to G2 uh, uh, by looking at, uh, uh, so rho is my, I don't know, I'm looking at ZG1 uh, rho minus one, it creates an isomorphic, uh, it creates a marking on G2. It has the same distribution uh, uh, as uh, ZG. So it's exactly what I was saying in the instance uh, of uh, translations, right? Uh, so uh, the marks, uh, uh, it, that was a deterministic case, the marks, if I translate the thing, the marks follow the translate, right? So for instance, the notion of universal mark that I described as this problem. Okay. And so uh, a fantastic uh, result, a quite general result is that G, G is a unimodular random graph. Uh, <coughs> then if I, if I mark it by a marking, then this guy is also unimodular. So, I mean, unimodular is preserved by, uh, by marking. And so I insisted on deterministic instances, but there are lots of random instances. You can also uh, add randomness in the marking, and uh, this preserves unimodular. And so, uh, in the term, I will give references, but in the terminology of uh, David Adus and uh, Russell Lyons, a mark unimodular graph is called a network. So if you're doing networks, interesting networks, you mean this nowadays. <laughs> okay. Now, what is an equivariant subset? Or if you want a stationary, if you were in the line subset, it's a set of vertices of the graph with mark one in some zero one value, the equivariant process. Okay, so you take an equivalent process, you take a marking, which is zero one value, and you select only the nodes or the vertices which have mark one. And so, um, if um, so, a quite general result is that uh, if G uh, zero is in the graph, uh, one can find the intensity of the uh, set of vertices, given subset of vertices, as simply the probability that the origin belongs to the set. Okay. So yes. Is this some kind of analogy to thinning? It is a thinning. Yeah. It is exactly the thinning. Okay. Now applications. So you have you have the old framework, I mean connections, and uh, so uh, it must look mysterious, but uh, to a master of these things, you need time. Okay, so let me start. To, I will. Uh, I intend to put the course through three applications, right? So if uh, time allows, the first one is about uh, random tessellations. 
And I want to give concrete uh, things, right? I mean, computation. So what is, it is a quite deep property because why is it deep? Because it goes to group theory, right? And so it's a very fundamental thing, as you know. And so there is this extension to randomness. And so in many cases, you uh, are you're helpless. You don't know what to do. You call unimodularity or mass transport and it helps. It saves you, right? And so, and I want to give three instances of that. Okay, the first one is a, a very classical. <coughs> Uh, you must all have seen the Voronoi tessellation. So you take a, a stationary point process. Uh, in R, uh, it, it works in R2. It's in R2. It's simple. Uh, the Voronoi cell uh, of, the, uh, of the random measure mu uh, uh, at atom T is the set of uh, invocations of R2, which are closer to T than to any other atom of mu. And so it creates a complex polyhedra. Sure. Uh, nice objects which have been studied uh, for centuries. <clears throat> okay. And so, uh, uh, and it, the interesting thing is to look at, uh, uh, the, at the typical, at typical polyhedron, uh, uh, Voronoi polyhedron. Right? And so, uh, this typicality is according to the plan description. So, um, okay. So, uh, what I call a mu was a uh, deterministic. Now take phi, which is a random point process, which is stationary, and then we call it phi two uh, for reasons that I will explain in a second. So for uh, x and atom of phi two, uh, I define the random uh, polyhedron V of x phi two, which is a Voronoi cell of x in phi two. So this guy is a polyhedron, so it has extreme points. It's an uh, intersection of uh, um, half spaces, so it's uh, in, in general, so here of uh, uh, lines. And there are extreme points, which are the intersection between two facets. And the facets, I mean, you've seen them here. Okay, so this is a facet, and this is an extreme point. And uh, these guys will be uh, the Voronoi cells, which are objects that live in, uh, which are uh, convex polyhedra in R2. It's why uh, these objects will be associated to things that live in, uh, so the facets are one dimensional, the vertices are one zero dimensional, and these objects are two dimensional, hence the numbering. Phi 2, uh, for the Voronoi cells, uh, if you want, or the Sari point process, the centroids of these Voronoi cells phi zero for the vertices and phi one for the uh, edge centers. And I call lambda I the intensity of phi. Okay. So lemma, so uh, there is this notion then of uh, palm expectation. So I decide, I, I define what palm was. It is a conditional, uh, can see it as a conditional probability of the universe, given that there is a point at the origin, right? So phi E zero two, uh, is the universe uh, seen from a uh, typical centroid of the Voronoi cell, or point of the point process. Okay. I call M the number of edges of facets of dimension one that the Voronoi cell of the origin has under uh, the typicality, uh, typical a point of the point process. This is, so come back to that. What is this? So assume uh, this uh, is a typical cell. I count how many one dimensional uh, facets uh, belong to this Voronoi cell of mine hmm? if I am typical. So the lemma says that uh, and uh, uh, two lambda one. So the mean number twice the mean number of uh, of, of, of uh, one dimensional facets of the Voronoi cell is lambda two the intensity of the point process times the expectation of the mean number of uh, of uh, facets uh, of the uh, per per uh, typical cell. So let's go through that the proof of that. It's mass transport in. Uh, and uh, okay, so you define a directed uh, bipartite graph with a directed edge sending mass one from each x in phi two to every point in phi one that belongs to the Voronoi set. Okay, so if I go back to uh, my uh, instance, what I sent mass, 
a set mass from this point to this guy, to this point to this guy, to this point to this guy, to this point to this point. To this point. That's what I said. Mass one to everybody, which is a center of segment, which is a, a boundary of my cell. Okay, let's do that. Then apply. So this is a this is a mass transport, and you see it's it's very fancy because I mean uh, it's it's not an IID thing, right? You you have to know the whole local geometry, at least local geometry, to count where facets are and things like that. Depends on. On neighbors and things like that. So it's a, but it's a mark. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a mark of the point process. This, uh, this graph is translation invariant. If I translate the whole graph, uh, these edges follow, right? So it is a marking, uh, and this graph is, this graph is, uh, is uh, invariant by uh, uh, translations, right? Very good. So we can apply the mass transport to it, principle, and apply it to phi one plus phi. With mass out, okay. So you have to do your palm calculus here. So the palm expectation of uh, phi one plus phi two is with this multiplicative coefficient the palm with respect to phi two, and with uh, this multiplicative coefficient the palm with respect to phi one. Okay, but look at mass out, right? So I send mass out only from point of phi two, not from point of phi one. So this is zero. And this is what we want, right? Now, what is mass in? Same jazz, but so now every facet is a facet between two nuclei, right? Two two cells, right? Then this is two. That's it. so. You see, I mean, you have not assumed anything. Uh, it's the functional is extremely complex, right? And uh, a very simple thing like that. It's, it's eliminating of what it does, right? So, okay. Now, uh, for the other one, you have to work a bit more. The other one first requires a, a bit more uh, 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 assumption. If P almost surely, no four points of phi two lie in the circle of R two. So you you know these things, right? So uh, for Poisson, it would it would be the case, but for grids, uh, for grids, you have to be careful, right? So. So there are good point processes which satisfy this property and the bad ones. But so all, all good uh, non-grid point processes, determinant or permanent or blah, blah, Poisson and uh, Cox, whatever, satisfy this property. Then I claim that a three lambda naught is lambda two E zero two of them. Same jazz. Okay. Um, let's look at... Uh, Let's look at an extreme point, this one. Okay. So, yes. So can you show with your mouse? Yes. Like right. Look at this one, this mouse. guy. Okay. So, uh, um, this guy, an extreme point. Uh, so, I was saying that a center of, uh, of edge was uh, between two, two cells, right? An extreme point, by definition, uh, should be such that uh, it is. Uh, at the same distance of every cell it belongs to, right? So it means that uh, there are at least three points, uh, uh, which are points of the point process, which are nuclei of the point process. So sorry, which are this one, which uh, belong to the circle, which are same distance from the extra, from the point in question, right? That's it. Okay. Now I claim that uh, there will be exactly three, right? Almost surely, right? Uh, because of my assumption, but this. Then what I do, I do exactly the same thing as before. I send mass, uh, I send mass one from uh, the uh, center of the cell, the, the nucleus of the cell, to every uh, edge, to every extreme point of the cell. How much do I send E of M? How much do I receive? Three. That's it. You have the formula. Okay. Then I take these two formulas. You had earlier formula, which uh, connects the lambda two, lambda one, and, uh, and uh, uh, lambda naught. And you get the general result that for every tessellation, a Voronoi tessellation it works in any dimension, of course, not with the same result. Uh, uh, but for Poisson, for instance, E0, two of M is equal to six. Lambda naught is two, lambda two. Lambda one is three, lambda two. With lambda two is lambda, we think that that you are interested in the, the, the data of your point process, but uh, everything uh, is built from the single point process. 
Okay, you see, it's, it's magic. <laughs> Okay, what is amazing is to connect that to uh, uh, unimodularity, and it comes from unimodularity. And so, if, if you were in the deterministic setting, this is, a, this is as strong, the properties I use are as strong as the one I mentioned at the beginning, uh, namely a mass transport for, uh, for groups. Right? Okay, optimization. Uh, I should have enough time to cover this one. Okay, so this is more. Can you, yes. can you, can you just. Uh, so, for example, the, the formula lambda zero is equal to two lambda two. Uh, roughly speaking, should I interpret it uh, like uh, there are twice as, as many uh, just zero dimensional mm -hmm. uh, exactly. yeah. uh, as there are uh, atoms in the in, in the first point process? And so you can see here because because this, this is. There is an ergodic interpretation. I will not have time to cover that, but I could. Uh, uh, I have lots of interest in that. So you could take a big ball and count in this big ball how many. And, and these two three point processes are very entangled, right? The centroid, the initial point process, the uh, edge uh, center point process, and the extreme point point process, right? So they are very. They're, they're anything else than in the and right? yeah, very entangled, right? But forget about this intricacies and think globally, take a big ball and you ask in this big ball, how many uh, type one, type zero, type mm -hmm. two points there are. And these lambdas would be the empirical averages when the, yeah. uh, when the ball uh, blows to infinity yeah. uh, of the number of points. Yeah. And so it, it exactly says this, right? Mm -hmm. And this E of M, there is a first interpretation you take a big ball, you ask each guy in uh, each centroid, each point of phi two in the ball, how many children of type uh, one do you have? <coughs> okay. And you make an empirical average, you blow the ball to infinity, and it answers six. Yeah, so roughly speaking, the cell has six a edges. Typical cell. A typical cell, yeah. Right, uh, because the so there is notion of cell containing the origin, mm -hmm. which is biased. Yeah. Or which, uh, okay, now some wireless application. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, you everybody knows about Aloha. This is Aloha for uh, uh, the so-called dipole model, right? So you have transmitter receiver pairs. And uh, uh, everybody tosses a coin in the initial law at random, independently of everything, to, to either chat or uh, silence for that slot. These are those transmitting, <coughs> and the other are silent. Yeah? And you do that to be considerate, but if everybody transmits at the same time, I mean, uh, there is lots of interference and uh, you are in bad shape, right? And so it has been studied a lot, right? But now what you want is to uh, use. Uh, that in an optimization framework where people use their environment, which is the what I call the universal mark. They look at what exists around them and they choose a mark as a mark, a, 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 a probability to transmit, which is a function of their environment. And the environment is really uh, where are receivers around the, their transmitter, right? Um, to, to try. And so the principle is that there is UTT function. You want to uh, 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 optimize, maximize the sum of the uh, rates, the function of the rates. The rates will be Shannon determined, and the F is the UTT function, right? And so all links uh, benevolently adapt their medium access probability to the local geometry so as to optimize that. This is a uh, Utility of classical utility optimization framework. And so you restrict yourself by, uh, the, if you are selfish, you say you transmit property one, but it is socially bad. And you, uh, you accept to uh, self control yourself by taking this mark of your access uh, uh, probability. Um, in, um, but under the condition that the others do the same, right? 
and uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, with the classical uh, setting, right? I suppose. Yeah. Okay. So links are uh, from xi to yi. Xi are uh, stationary from sets. Phi phi bar yi are receivers, also stationary. Of course, they are not independent uh, because we assume that uh, there are since r, for instance, uh, from uh, each link. Uh, there is a there are relay phase from everywhere to everywhere. And uh, this is uh, the uh, access decision of link J, which uh, has a law which is function of geometry. It, uh, okay, and the, uh, here is Shannon. There is N of I when three interference of noise, and um, the SINR will be the fade from transmitter I to receiver I times the R to the minus beta. Uh, beta is the path of segment divided by thermal noise plus. Uh, interference, increase <coughs> interference and noise. So um, there is a fade at first whether J or not transmits. Uh, then uh, there is the um, um, uh, 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 fade from uh, from uh, J to I, uh, and then there is the uh, the pass loss that is the attenuation, right? Okay, very good. That's the classical. And now what you do is that you will look at uh, this guy. So you introduce uh, the all, all fades except uh, the fade from I to I, right? The, on the link I, right? And you look at the condition of chance of success, uh, T is a threshold. Uh, if SNR is exceeds uh, exceed the threshold, you succeed or the fade. Uh, condition on the geometry and uh, these fades, which are all fades except uh, the one from I to I. Okay, and so uh, you look at look at that, right? So uh, since you are conditioned by geometry, these things are uh, <coughs> um, uh, these things are known, right? As well, uh, and so um, uh, so if you uh, <coughs> um, right, and uh, if you look at that now, uh, what is this? This is an exponential, so with the taken relay phase, uh, which is completely independent of everything here, right? Because of the condition. Therefore, this thing is nothing else as uh, e to the minus, so with the chance exponential parameter mu exceeds uh, this constant, because everything is known here, is e to the minus this sum, right? Just uh, that's the relay definition of the exponential, right? Okay, fair enough. And this is because FI is exponential parameter mu independent of uh, this uh, everything in there, right? Okay, now average out of our FI. Okay, so everything, uh, so now, uh, all these things. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah. right? Okay, where was I? Yeah, uh, I, 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 it was I'd concluded, right? So uh you you have this uh you have this um uh, uh, key step again uh where you have to solve uh you have to solve an optimization problem which, which makes no sense uh you use that you have under the palm which is unimodular modular to swap things and then you get an optimization problem which is clean in a single variable that you can solve explicitly and you're done and that this is the optimal solution I think it's uh, it's about the only case where people uh, uh, were able to entangle uh, optimization uh, and uh, and um, stochastic geometry. Usually, you do parametric optimization, uh, but here uh, the uh, an optimal solution in sense of this utility could be solved. Okay, uh, I'm not sure I have time to go through the in five minutes maybe. Okay, uh, let me just uh, yes. I said the result, uh, the proof is uh, the proof is very beautiful, but uh, um, I will, uh, okay. So this is about dynamical systems, right? And uh, this result is called the uh, unimodular point carré reconciliation. There are lots of results of ergodic theory, which have uh, unimodular uh, incarnations. Also, there is no measure preserving uh, transformation. So it's quite, quite amazing. Uh, so this is a result that, uh, uh, I will comment on the, uh, the history of it. It's called the unimodular point carré reference lemma. It says uh, take GO be, to be a unimodular network, the mark graph, if you want, or you know, a, a random graph. 
Okay, so it's that the number of vertices is almost surely infinite. So which is an interesting case. <laughs> okay. Uh, then any covariant subset, you remember what covariant was? So it was something which it would be analog of translation invariant, right? Uh, of the set of vertices uh, of the graph, right? Is either uh, um, uh, of cardinal zero or infinite. Okay, so it's the analog of, of Poincaré's uh, recurrence lemma. Uh, what, uh, what you see in, uh, in, in a ergodic system uh, um, uh, which has a positive probability for the stationary regime, in the ergodic case, you will see it uh, in happening infinitely often. Right? Uh, this is the, this is the, the, the thing. Right? Okay, so um, it would take uh, about 10 minutes to go in detail and prove. So I will, I will uh, skip that. But so I want to stress rather two things. First, I want to show a few references and uh, give the, where people, what people are doing uh, currently on that. But I want to stress that, I mean, for dynamical systems, uh, palm, so first, uh, uh, palm calculus, this is the, the key tool for uh, stochastic geometry, right? So to, to compute, to understand what you do. And this calculus, this universal calculus and mass transport is the generalization to things which are not Euclidean. So I discussed two Euclidean things, but I mean, uh, lots of the interesting results are for graphs. You have uh, uh, lots of graphs which are, have nothing to do with, uh, with Euclidean uh, things, especially in, uh, in, in uh, various random graphs that come from, I don't know, community detection, I mean, uh, um, social graphs, things like that, have no, nothing to do with Euclidean. And you need tools to understand these type of things uh, and, uh, and so you see an analog of palm calculus and also more surprisingly, analogs of, uh, of dynamical system uh, uh, um, results, right? Okay, so the proof is in two pages, but uh, each line counts, right? So let me insist more on bibliography. So, uh, uh, okay, so uh, there are this, um, uh, I think a fantastic paper is the Aldous and Lyons paper called the Processes on Unimodular Random Networks. Uh, it's uh, very compact, very beautiful. There is the book of Lyons and Perez, Properties on Trees and Networks, which discusses the framework. Um, and uh, there are lots of uh, things I wanted to cover, percolation and things like that. So there are lots of applications to percolation. Um, for Euclidean uh, things, I mean, of course, the classical references like the uh, book of Stoyan, which has a new edition. Um, okay, so uh, the uh, application to, uh, and so, for, so tessellations are discussed at length, and there are lots of other books, but this is a good entry point. There is a, a monograph of Jasper Muller on tessellations and uh, so, which is even predates that, right? So, but so there is a lot of literature on the Euclidean case. Uh, this application to, um, that I covered uh, uh, on uh, optimal control is uh, work with Bartek and uh, Chandramani Singh. <coughs> and uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the um, uh, unimodular Poincaré lemma uh, is a result we obtained with uh, Miromid and Ali. And it was uh, rediscovered by Lovash uh, uh, lately uh, on his paper on compact graphics. And so the naming uh, of uh, it as uh, Poincaré lemma is due to Lovash, but the, uh, the result uh, uh, was in our 2018 paper. Uh, and there are a lot of other things to, that, would, uh, that can be discussed also in the front and dimensions and graphs and things like that, but that would be for, for another occasion. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Francois. There, there, there was some, uh, uh, some questions during the talk. Uh, maybe we have time for one or two quick questions in the room, on the bridge. Ah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't seeing you. Okay. Um, so for the second example uh, the optimization of the transmission probability, 
Um, does it determine the whole point process? Ah, the operations, yes. Because, I mean, uh, so your question is uh, uh, very natural. So it looks odd to, uh, that's what we did first in the first papers with uh, uh, Chandra Mandi, that we had way of the thing. And so we would look at the whole thing, right? So you would have to learn, uh, you would have to learn the geometry up to infinity in order to look at uh, how to tune your your medium access product. And so, uh, but in, this, in, in the second paper, which we did for COM1, uh, we extended IDF and the uh, initial uh, setting. You, you would have a disk of, uh, uh, I would say, information, right? So you would know, for instance, I'm here, and I learn geometry in the disk of, uh, say, 10, 10 meters, a ball of values 10 meters, right? So I know what Francois is, I know what Michel uh, are, right? So, and I'm considerate, so I tune my I tune my map based on the local geometry in a ball, and outside I have it out, like in the parametric optimization. And so, if you do that uh, in balls, for instance, or in address or in stopping sets, then uh, you can extend the calculus and get an optimal uh, strategy, which would mix the parametric optimization outside the uh, knowledge ball and uh, the local geometry. Uh, People you care about, and you know, <laughs> only want to to uh, to be considered to, but they do the same, right? So let's. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Other questions on the bridge? Okay. So thank you, Monsieur.